I was thinking, I actually thought about this in mass tonight too. This is where it kind of came from in my thinking, but it's not just a religious topic or anything. But one of the things about Catholicism is that we believe in the authority of the apostles, right? Uh, when Jesus <clears throat> tells the apostles that, uh, you know, he, he he gives them, you know, the the authority, blesses them with the keys of the kingdom, whoever sins they retain or retained, whoever sins they remit or remitted, whatnot. I know that Protestants have a different uh, translation of that verse, or, or interpretation, rather, of that verse. But uh, one of the things the Catholic Church has always been built on is the spiritual authority that Jesus handed down to the apostles, and then the apostles handed down to their successors, and so forth. And it got me thinking about authority in general and how authority, I think we need, one of the problems with today's culture is that we need more authority. But authority is a dirty word today. Um, and it's been increasingly becoming a dirty word, you know, throughout the ages. It's true that authority, there's, there's almost nothing worse out there than corrupt authority. And since we're all human beings, any individual with authority you just count the seconds before some sort of corruption touches them. You know, maybe not much, maybe it's only momentarily or whatever, but, you know, uh, corruption happens. But the answer is not just to throw authority out the window. You know, I've never really understood, and I, I, let me say, I've understood it, this sort of extremist libertarian take on the world, um, you know, going all the way into like an ANCAP philosophy, you know, anarcho-capitalist philosophy or something like that. I understand the appeal. No one likes to be told what to do. No one likes to have somebody else have authority over them. It's not fun. It's not, you know, it, and, and especially when it's, it's so easily, <clears throat> you can so easily become uh, blinded by the corruption that happens in authority that you think there's no use for authority or that authority is evil. And that's not the case. It's never been the case in culture. We never would have had the great things we have today if it wasn't for authority. And that authority, more often than not, comes from a patriarchal society. Uh, it's built into our humanity in the fact that, you know, with a, with a man being sort of the father of the household and stuff, there's a certain authority to fatherhood. Uh, you know, you can take that as far as you want to, but just even on the basic level, like a child is going to respond to the father's deep voice saying, get out here now, rather than a mother saying, <laughs> you know, whatever. Not that mothers can't be terrifying and have their own sense of, uh, you know, discipline and authority, but you know what I mean? It's just sort of a basic thing, you know, that the, uh, you know, there's an authority when it comes to fatherhood. And our culture has tried to push authority aside, belittle the the um nature of authority you know in in america <clears throat> part of that was the american experiment you know the preference for democracy part of it was the fact that um really protestantism various shades of protestantism really kind of you know gripped america you know there was catholics from the beginning of course um, or Anglicans from the beginning, of course, because Anglicans have their own sort of set of liturgical authority. Uh, Mormonism started in, in um, you know, really the, the church kind of, you know, came about in America there at a certain time. And it, I think from my understanding of Mormonism is it has its own sort of level of authority there. But the real, you know, if you think about American Christianity, the real thing you think about is is more of a sort of evangelical um non-associated whether it's non-denominational or just sort of your you know your baptist here you're this and that there and there's not a lot of authority binding that together um now i'm not trying to <clears throat> straw man it at all because of course a, a faithful protestant will tell you no our authority is the the word of god but there's no decided interpreter of that authority outside of each individual's relationship with the holy spirit right that's what they would tell you so as a result if somebody misbehaves in, you know, Park Street, Free Baptist Church or whatever, <clears throat> and the congregation is, you know, upset about this, you know, to the point, you know, something extreme, and they and they boot this person from the congregation, that person can just go start their own church two blocks down and call themselves pastor. You know, um, there, there's no sort of sense of authority or, uh, or sense of, um, yeah, I mean, it's just really authority, you know, um, authority has to have consequences. There has to be consequences or else, not, or else you don't really have an authority. And, uh, you know, so we did, so we kind of booted that idea, you know, 
mainstream culture wise from even religion to the point where now we're like mainstream culture doesn't even like the idea of any religion, you know, any kind of talk about anything like that. You have a lot of people trying to reject any and all authority of the state, which, hey, I'm all for let's fight against the tyranny of the state. <laughs> My goodness, you know, um, America was founded on the principles that you elect your leaders and then you watch them like a hawk and hold their feet to the fire because the power's with the people and so forth. And we've gotten far too far away from that. But nonetheless, there was a government established, you know, power is necessary. And we're seeing the consequences today of a world without authority. <clears throat> and there's a basic, there's a basic uh, authority innate in, in, a, in a, the, the American monomyth, in a hero, in any of our heroic archetypes. Uh, they're, they're taking the authority of justice, right? No, this is wrong what you're doing, villain, and I'm here to stop you. And, and our culture is consistently and, and you know, um, trying to, to more and more say, yeah, but what's wrong? I mean, who are you to say that's wrong? What if we have a movie about that villain and their story and you see what they went through and you actually kind of see it from their perspective and is it wrong? I mean, I don't know, you know? I mean, you know, Cruella was was mistreated by Dalmatians, you know? <laughs> I mean, this all is nonsense, you know? <clears throat> because we're, we're so, you know, culture in general and, and certainly the ideologues hate this idea of authority, uh, hate it. So, of course, they're going to hate traditional masculinity, traditional fatherhood, and hate traditional hero stories, which would stem from this idea. You know, uh, it, it's, it's no, you know, you guys have been talking about it, you know, it's, it's no surprise that people looking for father figures growing up or whatever do latch on to certain fictional characters and certain heroes because it's example, you know, archetypically you've got the, the tyrannical father or the, the benevolent father, you know, and they, you, they've been called different things, but um, you know, the wicked King or the good King or whatever. And uh, there's nothing worse than a tyrannical father. Oh my gosh. You know, that tyrannical father archetype is, is, uh, is a great source of evil. It is the villain, you know, but the, you, you can't throw out the benevolent father with that. It's uh it's necessary. It's part of uh culture falls apart without it. Culture, society falls apart without it. You know, look at the type of, of films, you know, like a Captain Marvel, you know, the Marvel's Captain Marvel or whatever. Those kind of uh, movies where the ideologues have made who reject this idea of basic authority. What is that movie all about? She has been abused by this authority system. <clears throat> she needs to break free from that. Um, does she ever really like learn to be self-giving or learn to put herself aside and serve others? No. Her story arc is about how she needs to realize that she is amazing and she needs to shine and she needs to, she, and she needs to throw this off and she needs to, it's not about anybody else. It's about her, you know, and that's the kind of uh, stories that we get, you know, hero stories that we get when we discard the idea of authority at all. Um, I love stories that, that encourage us to question or to, to um you know as i say hold hold our leaders feet to the fire but we still need leaders we still need that authority uh it's basic there you know so um th that's something that i see in terms of the world war on fathers and, and it's an idea that i think we could talk about more and i could develop it a bit more and and, and stuff but, you know uh sound engraver you know I've, I've talked about it i'm showing her the stargate you know, uh, shows, well, Stargate SG-1 and Stargate Atlantis. And it's, it's a uh, third time I've watched Stargate SG-1 through, but I was telling her, we just started Atlantis the other day. Cause you know, we're watching in order. And now that we're on Atlantis, we're going to bounce back and forth, watch one SG-1, one Atlantis, you know, in the order of, of their airing. But, uh, I said, I think this is my second, only my second time through watching Atlantis. <clears throat> I don't think I ever actually rewatched that from back in the day, but you know, at this point in the Stargate universe, um, I hate saying Stargate Universe because that implies I'm talking about that horrible third series they did. But, you know, the, this, the Stargate SG-1 universe, let me say. <clears throat> um, there, there's, there's questions in the fictional world about well, who should be in charge of the Stargate. You know, once more countries start finding out about it, you know, should we really let the Americas, you know, or, or America uh, maintain control of this, you know, and then they have to have treaties with each other to appease, which is, you know, it's good writing. That's something that would certainly would happen. But we're going to see more. I don't want to say anything because I'm not going to spoil it for Sound Engraver, but we're going to see more and more of that. Like, who really should be in charge? Should it be a military um, at the top of the authority, or should it be a civilian? Because 
militaries are supposed to answer to civilians in America. That's the American tradition that the military answers to the president, who is an elected civilian, supposed to be anyway, right? Um, because if you just have a military in power, then you've got a, a, a um, what's the word? Domineering, um, can't think of the word. But anyway, that's what we see in like, you know, uh, third world countries and whatnot, you know, this military regime throwing over the other one and setting up their own power and so forth. So, um, so it's an interesting question. And, uh, and we see that played out in fiction quite well on the, at the same time, you need good, strong leadership. You know, anybody who's been in the military or if you've been in law enforcement or whatever, you need that chain of command. You need a clear chain of command. I mean, sometimes you even worked in jobs, I'm sure where you know, you needed this, you need a clear chain of command. Authority is necessary. It's necessary in families. Parents need to have authority over children. Some some of these, you know, especially you get to the crazy hippie ideologues that, you know, oh, well, you know, we're just going to have a talk with the kid and this and that about their feelings, you know, <laughs> like that kid needs to be smacked. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, you know, discipline is what I mean. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, sounded great. Right? That's right. <laughs> Stargate is how you write men in command. That's right. General George Hammond. This is, this is awesome. I like the other, um, again, I'm trying to not to spoil anything for Sound Engraver because right now we're in season eight. So she knows that Brigadier General Jack O'Neill is head of the SGC. But I like, uh, I like all of the ways that, that Stargate places those in command. It's interesting. You know, Stargate's a good example of this. Because even in Stargate Atlantis, and again, I'm not going to steal anything or, or spoil anything for Sounding Graver here, but you have Dr. Elizabeth Weir. You know, we just started Atlantis. She's just started watching it through for the first time. So you have Dr. Elizabeth Weir there as the, the one in charge of Atlantis. And that kind of makes sense because you would need, on one level, you'd need a more feminine uh energy to go out into another galaxy like that and uh you know maintain relations with the new peoples and all of that you know nevertheless you can't just have you can't have an action adventure show with just a feminine energy in charge it doesn't work so you know right off the bat you've got major shepherd <clears throat> um but then of course uh what's his name the guy from x-files who shows up as colonel caldwell you know you need that masculine military um presence as well and authority you know uh because you, you things don't get done otherwise things you know um you need you need both you know that's why children need both a mother and a father as masculine and feminine natures are are vital and i know and a little lot of you know kids for whatever reason have to grow up without one or the other but that's why they they'll ultimate they'll they'll naturally seek out father or mother figures where one might be missing you know it's just natural uh oh al's taken off Hey, y'all, thank you uh, so much. A good night. Got to get up early to get Hubby's special Father's Day donut for breakfast. That's pretty sweet. Well, happy Father's Day to him. Have a great Father's Day weekend and weekend. Thank you, A.L. Thanks for stopping in and hanging out with us there. Um, Andre Hernandez, thank you so much for the $20 super chat. Very much appreciated, sir. Said, as someone who knew buff jocks to be jerks, I think what made characters like Superman and Captain America so special is the way they were big and strong but they weren't jerks. They were kind, cool, and wholesome Boy Scouts. Yeah, that's the um, that's the difference. Maybe they, you know, I don't think Steve Rogers ever grew up playing, you know, sports. He was actually too sickly or whatnot. But um, but you know, different tellings of the of, the, of the Superman story have him maybe playing football or at least following football or whatnot. You know, so maybe they played sports, but they weren't. Not that there's anything innately wrong with being a jock. That's fine. But they weren't the stereotypical jocks. They were stereotypical. The other word you said, Boy Scouts. You know, that that's that's great. I mean, that's the um because what what did a what did an organization like the Boy Scouts back in the day try and teach little boys, you know, to be um have integrity, to to love God in their country. I mean, this was part of the basic I mean, it's certainly never gonna be anything like that today in today's culture. But that's there, you know, we, we've lost that sense of fraternities from it. You know, that idea just occurred to me, you know, because I've mentioned before that I recently joined the Knights of Columbus, which is a, it's just a Catholic fraternity. <clears throat> but there are other, you know, 
Christian fraternities and stuff like that are, you know, but men need, um, they need to be sharpened by other men. They need that sort of, uh, and they need the authority of other men. It's always been a hard thing for me because I'm such an introvert. And I also hate the stereotypical men's gathering. <laughs> you know, even before I became Catholic, when I was at you know various Protestant churches or whatever, I hated going to like a men's group or a men's retreat because like, oh, you see that football game? Where you? I, I built a deck on the back of my house last week. And now you're like, what, what size board do you use for that? I'm like, I don't care about any of this crap. This is the most boring, inane garbage I can think of. The so, oh, I just hate it. I hate that kind of thing. But I think that's that's a that's indicative of the problem where you know our culture has has thought of as men doing men's stuff is so trivial. Oh, they're just talking about a bunch of sports things or are they not that that's not I mean it's fine if you're into sports, that's fine. If you're into, you know, carpentry or whatever, that's fine. But men getting together really talking about important serious stuff, we've lost the idea of the intellectual. You know, everybody wants to talk about their man cave right now, but no one wants to talk about their study. You know, uh, we, we've lost the idea of, of and that's real manhood. Uh, not that every man has to be a, an egghead, you know, um, intellectual or a professor or whatever, you know, but but talking about important philosophical and spiritual things is part of is part of manhood, it's part, certainly part of fatherhood. My goodness, you know, so, um, yeah, that's part of it, too. Again, like I told you, I don't really have a set outline tonight. I'm just kind of talking off the cuff and, uh, you know, <laughs> getting through this stuff here.